Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Cody Cassidy, and I'm the Outreach Associate here at GuideStar. We are excited to have you all join us today to learn about the exciting recently released Money for Good research. Fundraising is always a timely topic for those of us in the nonprofit sector, so this is certainly an interesting and important discussion, and I'm sure today we'll provide you with some meaningful insight. But before we begin, I want to go over a few housekeeping items. First, we're recording today's event, so rest easy. If you missed a point or didn't have a chance to write down a note, you'll receive an email within 48 hours with links to the slides and a recording from today's event to go back to as you'd like. Next, we have blocked off about 15 minutes at the end of today's event to answer your questions. To submit a question, simply drop it into the Q&A box here within the WebEx platform. If you don't see that right now, move over to the top of your screen and select the Q&A button. If you're on a Mac, it looks a little different. The button is on the bottom. And with that, I did also want to take just a quick moment to share some really exciting news from the world of GuideStar. Today, as you may have already heard, we officially launched GuideStar Platinum. If you haven't heard of GuideStar Platinum before, imagine this. You overhear a conversation where someone says something like, yeah, that's a really good nonprofit. Their overhead is less than 9%. Imagine that the nonprofit is a food pantry, and being the smart, savvy nonprofit professional you are, you think to yourself, hmm, does that 9% necessarily mean that it's a good nonprofit? Does that mean the organization is making great progress towards its mission of ending hunger in the community? The answer is, of course, maybe, but also maybe not. At GuideStar, we've been saying for a long time that the overhead ratio and other financial ratios are, of course, crucial and informative, but they aren't the whole conversation if we're really interested in understanding if a nonprofit is effective or not. The best measure of a nonprofit success is, well, a measure of the nonprofit success. But given the vast diversity of the sector, figuring out how to measure success and share those metrics has been our moon landing, really. Enter GuideStar Platinum, our latest effort to help nonprofits share their actual results and progress for free. If you're interested in learning more about GuideStar Platinum, please head over to guidestar.org slash platinum to learn more. And at the end of today's event, you'll have a pop-up survey come up. If you'd like some more information or help getting the Platinum, just let us know and we will reach out. And with that, let's not waste any more time. We're here to talk about money for good. So I am very, very happy to introduce our friends, Hope Neighbor of Camber Collective, Allison Carlman of Global Giving, and Karen Stein of Network for Good. Combined, we have an extraordinary wealth of knowledge at hand today. So without any further ado, let's get started. Hope, take it away. Great, Cody, thank you so much for the introduction and also for hosting us today. I know that you, GuideStar, has a lot going on with GuideStar Platinum, so both congratulations and thank you for your wonderful time and energy in putting this on. So what we'd like to talk about today is why Americans giving is stuck and how nonprofit fundraisers can turn this around to create more dynamic relationships with their donors. And as Cody has mentioned, we'll present for about 40 minutes and then open the floor for your questions, which we're really looking forward to. We're very excited to have as many of you with us um, as we have today. So to start us off, what I'd like to do is first give you a sense of who's presenting. I'll start with myself. My name is Hope Neighbor. I'm a partner at Camber Collective. And Camber is a boutique strategy consulting firm that works with foundations, nonprofits, and mission-driven companies. We have offices in Seattle and San Francisco, but work both nationally and internationally. And in my work, I, I focus on public-facing pieces of work that, like the Money for Good research, which I'll talk about today, provide insights into human behavior that help foundations, governments, and nonprofits in their funding, policy, and programming decisions. In this webinar, we wanted to cover both what the Money for Good research found and how fundraisers can use it, and that's why I thought it would be really valuable if I asked uh, a few experts in nonprofit fundraising and fundraising for their own organization to participate in the conversation and to talk about how they might think about, or in Allison's case, have actually used the Money for Good results in reality. So for that reason, I invited Karen Stein from Network for Good and Allison Carlman from Global Giving to share their perspectives and experience and I'll ask each of them to introduce themselves in turn. Karen, could I ask you to introduce yourself? 
Great, thank you so much, Hope. My name is Karen Stein. I am the Vice President of Communications and Content here at Network for Good. Um, Network for Good provides online fundraising software and services for small to mid-sized nonprofits, and we're proud to have helped distribute uh, $1.4 billion to 125,000 nonprofits across the country since 2001. Um, my role here is really to focus on how to provide nonprofits with the right resources, templates, and training to make make their uh, fundraising more effective, their marketing more compelling, and so that they get the most use um, out of the technology that we provide. So some of the resources that you'd likely be familiar with from, from my team here at Network for Good are things like the nonprofit marketing blog, our weekly tips newsletter, e-guides, templates, uh, and our nonprofit 911 webinar series. And so I'm excited to join this um, conversation today because we often reference a lot of the money for good research as, as we train nonprofits across the country to help them just create more effective messages to get donors to give more. Erin, thank you so much and thank you for joining. Allison? Great. Thanks so much to GuideStar and to the Camber team for having me. So I'm Allison from Global Giving. I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications. And Global Giving is the first and largest global crowdfunding community for nonprofits. So we work to help local organizations anywhere in the world get the funding, the tools, the training, and support they need to become more effective. And we were interested in the Money for Good study, uh, not only to inform our own fundraising tactics, because we do fundraise on behalf of our nonprofit partners on our website, but also because we wanted to pilot the tools to help refine them um, so that they, you know, to help them make sure they work in reality and in practice, and then also to learn how to better train our nonprofit partners as they're fundraising for their work. Great, Allison, thank you so much. Excellent. So to start off the conversation, we wanted to provide some level setting around fundraising, the intersection between fundraising and money for good. And the, the ingoing that I really come to, is, of course, many of you know on the line very well, is that fundraising is extremely hard. And the money for good research, when we um, originally did it, both in 2010 and with this most recent iteration of research in 2015, really targeted those who wanted to change Americans' giving behavior. And over the past couple of months, though, a number of nonprofit fundraisers have made the case to me that it's important for those raising money, um, for specific nonprofits as well, is they need fresh ways to engage their donors. And that's becoming ever more challenging as we look at an increasingly competitive fundraising environment and one which tends to focus on tactics and tools and sometimes lacks a bit of the um, strategic overview and tool and, and um, means that nonprofit fundraisers can use to really engage in quality, quality conversations with their donors, whether that's virtually or in person. And so because um, th there's both this notion that fundraising is really challenging and that the money for good results could be helpful to, um, to addressing some of the core issues in fundraising, we decided to do this webinar. So again, thank you for participating today. There are a couple of things that we will explore today. The, the first is why Americans giving is stuck based upon the Money for Good 2015 research. The second are key opportunities to change donor behavior. And the third, and this is really where Karen and Allison's experience will come in, is in how you can do the, use this research, both to start a new conversation with your donors and, as we see it, as a great way to revitalize American giving and our tradition or our practice of giving in this country. These are also the um, objectives of the Money for Good 2015 research. And that research, which I'll speak about just briefly, uh, has really aimed to provide a baseline understanding of Americans' giving behaviors to inform how we think about changing American giving behavior. For us, it's very important to understand what current behavior looks like in order to identify how to change it. We wanted to call, I wanted to call out at this moment that the, um, the research may validate what you already know and may inform your thinking about how you think about strategy going forward. It may also be a useful support in your uh, discussions with your border leadership. And so we really hope that the, the research is, in, in some cases, just reinforcing what you may already believe or in other cases providing new insights that might be helpful to you in the work that you do. In addition to the research that we'll, I will cover in the webinar today, I also wanted to mention that Money for Good 2015 has done research on different giving channels, including workplace giving, point of sale giving, and donor advised funds. It's provided information on the appetite of specific demographics, including millennials, women, and high net worth individuals 
support a different giving experience and provides coverage of the appetite for impact investing through donor advised funds. So if you're interested in any of those topics, I would very much encourage you to go to the Canva Collective website and download the Money for Good report, which is provided for free. And as a last note, this research was funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the William and Flora Hewitt Foundation, the F. B. Heron Foundation, and the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Of course, we're incredibly grateful to those, to those funders for, for funding this work. We would not be here today without them. I wanted to spend, before we dive into what the research actually says, I wanted to spend a few moments on the methodology. In this research, we targeted individuals with household income of $80,000 a year and above, and we oversampled individuals with household income of $300,000 a year and above. We focused on those with household income of $80,000 a year and above because they make up the top 30% of all U.S. households in income terms and make about 75% of all charitable gifts. And we focused on $300,000 and above because they make a disproportionate share of all charitable contributions, and we wanted to understand whether individuals with um, greater household income were fundamentally different from those with um, significant but still not the same levels of household income. We, uh, the research included three components, a literature review, focus groups with, um, with individuals in the, the groups mentioned as left, and a national survey of 3,000 Americans that roughly, uh, was roughly nationally representative. There are a few ways in which the research is unique. First and foremost, and this research approach represents the best known way to understand a full population's needs around charitable giving because we ask a host of questions about Americans' needs, attitudes, and behaviors around giving rather than trying to test a specific idea or concept and because the research is nationally representative. The second piece that makes it quite unique is that in combining an assessment of behaviors and attitudes, we're able to understand how the, the respondents to the survey and how, therefore how Americans within this group of individuals with household income of $80,000 a year and above are likely to behave in the future. And the third piece is that in our survey methods, we tend to, particularly around difficult questions where we believe that donors may not know um, what they actually want or may not be able to respond directly to the question, we ask um, respondents to make trade-offs in, in responding to the survey that mimic the type of trade-offs they would need to make in decisions in real life. And I can always talk more about the methodology as desired during the Q&A session. But without further ado, I'd like to jump into the actual research. So the, the context for the research is that American giving has not significantly increased since the 1970s. And in addition to what you see on the slide, we also observe uh, that giving patterns are largely stagnant. So we don't intentionally give to new nonprofits consistently year over year. There's not a whole lot of refreshing and relooking at the way in which um, we as donors give every year. And so one of the interesting things um, to, to me in thinking about this research is asking myself, you know, we're clearly so generous as a country, and so is our giving habit really this like, stagnant and stuck? How do we think about giving? So first, a bit more on how we think about giving. The first observation is that Americans give back, as many of you on the phone know, at very high rates. We have extremely strong habits around giving and volunteering as a country. 95% of households give to charity. 71% think about how much to give in a given year. 69% volunteer. 64% have attended a nonprofit event in the last year. These are very, very strong um, behaviors, high levels of behavior around giving. We also believe that it's critical that we give back. So in our qualitative research, we heard a couple of things very clearly. First, donors believe that giving is part of the social contract. It's something that we, if we can do it financially, then we must do it. And giving builds our sense of family, it builds our sense of community, our sense of self, and what it means to be American. And also, interestingly, we do not view kindly those who do not give. In the focus group, we heard people who choose not to give called self-centered, selfish, or scrooges. We really think it's extremely important to give and part of what it means to be, um, to live in this country. And finally, we have very strong norms around giving. If you look on the, if the highlighted boxes on the slide, we, say, we see that 84% of respondents say, say that it's very important to give back. 72% say that everyone has a responsibility to give. 
And almost half, 47%, say that giving is central to their lives, not just a part of their lives, but central to their lives. So to me, one of the very interesting questions here is with giving playing such a prominent part in our, um, in our lives, why haven't giving levels changed in the past 40 years? And there are four reasons, which I'll briefly touch on on this slide and then go into each one in turn. First, we're relatively satisfied with our giving. Second, many, uh, many donors lack trust in nonprofits and beneficiaries. Third, donors feel overwhelmed or ill-equipped to make good giving decisions. And fourth, they have limited insight into how their giving measures up. And I'll spend a moment on each one of these dynamics. First, donors are satisfied with their giving across age, group, age groups. And as you can see on this slide, levels of satisfaction increase slightly with age. But a, an average of 79% of donors are satisfied with their giving experience. This is a very high level of satisfaction in comparison to satisfaction in consumer products. So donors are pretty happy with their current giving experience. At the same time, there are donors who are skeptical of nonprofits or of beneficiaries. And this is really a second reason that giving is, as we would phrase that giving is stuck. Uh, nearly half of donors say that they don't know how nonprofits use their money. 34% feel hassled by the frequency of solicitation. 20% aren't sure who benefits from the work a nonprofit does. And 15% are concerned about enabling others. And we really heard these, these twin um, trends in our qualitative as well. And I would say that it is not all donors who share the skepticism, but the, those who do have the skepticism feel it quite strongly. And their donors tend to be either concerned about enabling the poor or concerned that they're helping overstretch nonprofit organizations to sustain themselves rather than helping thriving organizations grow stronger. So there's a level of skepticism that donors have that uh, they don't feel is currently being addressed in their interactions with nonprofits, and that's problematic. The third piece is that a sub donors or a subset of donors feel overwhelmed by the giving process. And interestingly, feeling overwhelmed isn't just around lack of information. As you see on the slide, 13% of donors say that they don't have enough information to make a good decision. But donors also say that they feel overwhelmed when they're deciding um, when or how to give, and they don't know what to consider in the giving process. More than a simple lack of information, they don't understand oftentimes how to approach the giving process, and it feels incredibly overwhelming. And so one of the things I think we want to do as a sector is to help donors when they begin to feel overwhelmed, um, demystify the process for them, and also identify those segments of donors that are most likely to feel overwhelmed. And interestingly, millennials are extremely likely to feel overwhelmed. And the segment, which I'll discuss in just a few minutes, that we call the cautious driver, is also very likely to feel overwhelmed by the giving process. So we want to make sure when we engage with those groups of donors that we're speaking to this concern and helping them to feel, to feel less overwhelmed by the giving process. And finally, the fourth reason that giving is stuck is that donors believe that they're giving more than they are. So the, on this slide, 4.4%, um, the median giving is 4.4% of household income. The average giving is 3.6% of household income. And this results in 72% of donors giving less than average, but 75% believe that they're giving more. So there's just a flat-out issue in that donors believe that they are giving more than they actually are, and that's a problem. So what's donors' response to this? They, as a result of these dynamics, they keep really comfortable, familiar giving habits. Donors give to the, tend to give to the same organization year over year. They don't research that often, and when they do, it's primarily to validate the choice of the nonprofit. And they like to give to organizations that they know, and they have a slight preference towards giving to local nonprofits. So these are suboptimal giving patterns. And I think the way that I um, square the circle between incredible focus and dedication to giving at the same time, these giving habits that don't have a lot of change over um, year over year, is I think about giving as a tradition like Thanksgiving. It's a tradition that we cherish that doesn't have that much change. So in other words, we have giving habits as a country, but we don't have a dynamic giving practice. And what we've thought about a lot within the Money for Good research and the, the opportunities that we see to change behavior that I'm about to turn to is how we can help to build that dynamic giving practice again and shift away from giving as a non-changing tradition. The good news is that 
there is an opportunity to change behavior, and if we do reshape the donor experience to better meet donor needs, there's quite a bit of financial opportunity on the table. Um, the, and what you're seeing on this slide is that um, we analyze the opportunity in terms of new donations and donations that can move from one organization to the other if the organization B does a better job of serving donors than organization A. And what we found is that there's an opportunity to increase giving by $22 billion, which with individual giving at $241 billion, is about 10% of total giving. That's an incredible amount. And there's also an opportunity to switch $25 billion in giving for a total impact of $47 billion. So this is a tremendous amount of money that is available to either go to different nonprofits or to new nonprofits if we are able to create a more meaningful conversation with donors and get them excited about giving again. There are three ways that we see to change donor behavior, and I'll spend a few minutes on each of these. The first is to reframe giving. The second is to target donor segments and to shape the giving experience to meet each segment's needs. And the third is to correct these misperceptions that donors have about their giving. So on the first, reframing giving, we suggest that every donor communication embeds these four elements or three of these four elements in the communication. Because we really think that giving is very consistent with what I just mentioned about introducing a new revitalized giving practice. We think that there needs to be this dynamic giving practice that we all begin to aspire to, which is a kind of uh, would be a wonderful shift from where we are today. I will speak through to each of these these elements in turn. So um, dynamism in giving is we, we very much think about needing to introduce some change in behavior. I've been talking a lot using sports analogies for whatever reason and really thinking about, you know, today in many ways in terms of um, donor behavior, donors to some degree are couch potatoes. And what we are trying, oftentimes trying to do is we are suggesting that they've gotten up off the couch and have begun to run and we're correcting their stride. And I don't think that's actually the most constructive approach. I think that we need to encourage donors to get up off the couch and to simply get moving in their giving practice. And so introducing some notion of consistent change to the practice from which donors can learn and grow increasingly curious about their giving experience would be a fantastic addition to giving behavior and giving practice. The second dimension in communications that's really important, and I don't think this will be a surprise to very many of you at all, is um, emphasizing connection. The piece where connection becomes quite important is when we think about organizations that are trying to raise money on behalf of populations that feel very unfamiliar to donors or populations that they don't know, like um, individuals who are living overseas and are served by organizations who are working internationally. And I think this is a, a place where technology can play a wonderful role in driving, uh, figuring out how to drive more connection between donors and, and the individuals or organizations um, that, are, that are doing work elsewhere that they don't have a physical connection with. Simplicity in messaging is incredibly important. Um, one of the, the messages that has worked when we've done some A-B testing around messaging is that problems may seem complicated, but giving doesn't have to be. And I think that embedding, uh, making sure that messaging is sim simple and straightforward is incredibly important. And then the fourth dimension of this um, reframing of giving is ensuring that the message is joyful. And we, we want to make sure that we continue to allow giving to be something that is joyful for Americans as it, as it is today. And we don't want to diminish that by any stretch of the imagination. At the same time, we do not want to ignore the elephants in the room. So there are these um, four reasons for which giving is stuck. We've kind of summarized as satisfaction, concerns around giving, and misperceptions. And we need to address these with donors either directly or indirectly. Um, if, if we don't, we make donors feel as if we're ignoring their concerns and therefore are not addressing the core reasons that they hesitate to give more. And so I think there's a real opportunity if we can engage significantly with donors about the way in which they give and their hesitations around giving to actually increase their commitment both to giving to a single organization as well as to giving in general. And I think that opportunity is very exciting. The second suggestion that we would make is to target the donor segments that are most likely to change their behavior. So we, uh, we did a statistical analysis of the donors that we surveyed, and we derived five segments of donors, each of which has different needs, attitudes, and behaviors around giving. 
And the reason that we focus on segments that are, um, that are organized around needs and behaviors is that we believe it's very important to, we, we recognize that within any given demographic group, everyone may not be the same. And people um, who look very similar demographically may have very different motivations around giving. And so these segments pull out those, those groups of individuals who need uh, different giving experiences. I want to spend just a few minutes talking through two of these segments. So we suggest focusing in terms of if we want to change Americans' giving behavior and if any given nonprofit wants to think about targeting a single segment of donors, um, there are three that we recommend focusing on. They're the busy idealists, the cautious drivers, and the unaware potentials. The, uh, I will talk through cautious drivers and unaware potentials just to give you a sense of how each of these segments are different and therefore how you might shape a different giving experience. For unaware potentials, which are the fourth group down on the slide, they represent 28% of all donors. And for this donor, giving isn't a priority for them currently. This individual doesn't have any major concerns around giving, but also doesn't think that much about giving. And so she gives less than average and is also less engaged than others in giving, but she believes that she gives more. So our sense is that the behavioral hook for an underwear potential is to let her know that she's not giving as much as she thinks she is and let her begin to ask herself why that is and whether she should be giving more or giving differently. By contrast, the cautious striver, who represents 14% of all donors, is very committed to both giving and giving back. This individual comes from a modest background, and they believe that others contributed to his or her success, so as mentioned, they do believe in giving back. However, while they're financially comparable to a busy idealist, this, this donor, this cautious driver, doesn't yet believe that he's in a position to give back, and so he's concerned that he won't do it right. So he needs information about how much people at his income level give and guidance on how to give successfully. So if you think about the, the, the offer, the donor experience that you would provide to an unaware potential versus a cautious driver, it's actually quite different. The unaware potential doesn't necessarily have insecurity or concerns about how she might approach giving. In fact, she believes that she's already doing more than she is. By contrast, the cautious driver is very committed to giving back but isn't sure if he or she is at a financial point to be able to do so. So uh, if we think about how the, the donor experience might vary, it really bifurcates for those, for those two segments. And just as a quick note, the, we also calculate the, quote, market opportunity or ability to uh, move dollars and target any, any one of these segments. And so as we can see on, on the slide, busy, busy idealists, cautious drivers, and unaware potentials all represent a market opportunity of about $12 billion, which is to say that any single organization can have plenty of, there's plenty of opportunity to appeal to even one of these segments, and so there isn't a need to reach out to all three. We typically suggest that an organization choose one or two segments to reach out to. And I wanted to provide a brief note in, um, in terms of additional resources for using the segment, the segmentation. There is a segmentation toolkit that is available in the appendix of the full Money for Good report, which includes more information on each segment, more numbers on the segment, potential characteristics of what we call an offer or donor experience and messaging concepts. And we also provide a donor classification tool, which enables you to survey your donor base and then identify based on either your current donor base or another population that you would choose to survey, the segments into which that population falls. And you can then use that to drive your strategy or your tactics. And Allison will speak in just a few minutes about global giving the experience and using this, this donor classification tool. The third opportunity that we see for correcting um, for, for changing individual donors' behavior is in correcting donor misperceptions. And of course, as um, I touched on a few minutes ago, the biggest opportunity here is realigning their expectations about how much they actually give. We also think there's opportunity to, uh, to ask donors whether or not they've intentionally changed an organization to which they give in a given year or whether they've made another change in their giving practice. And the idea is just to experiment with different ways of asking donors or making them aware of, of um, the degree of change in their giving practice. Acknowledging that typically there's probably not that much change in their giving practice, we kind of want to spark their curiosity or make them aware of that and then spark their curiosity about whether it might be a good idea to begin to introduce a bit of change in their practice. So using the research, 
if we think about using the research, the first thing that we would do is um, we've teed up a set of questions that we thought might be helpful for nonprofit fundraisers. Uh, and we would suggest printing out this page and using this as a discussion guide and conversation within your own organization. In the interest of time, I'm not going to talk through every one of the questions on the page, but I will touch simply um, walk you through the organizing principle here, which is that we have a series of questions that if you uh, print out your 2016 to 17 fundraising strategy and plans, you could ask, um, ask what specific opportunities are to change that strategy and plan um, if you would like to help in reframing the donor conversation and uh, reestablishing a new conversation platform with your donors if you'd like support in choosing the segments that you think would be most appropriate for your organization and then in tailoring the donor experience to meet segments needs. And of course, there's um, a decision to be made about whether or not you would like to go after new donor segments. In that case, you'd want to think about changing your donor acquisition strategy or really focus on changing your current donor experience and in that case, um, change some of your stewardship efforts. And one thing we do want to emphasize is that because we're such so early days in thinking about how to use the money for good research and findings in actual organizations, it's really important to think about what, um, what you're setting out to learn from the exercise and then what you are actually learning and how down the line that might permanently change the way in which you allocate resources internally or organize your fundraising, your fundraising team or activities. With that, and without any further ado, I would love to transition to Karen Stein to talk us through how we might use the money for good results in, in reality and in practice every day, shifting from the research findings. Karen, can I hand it over to you? Sure, great. Thank you so much, Hope, and I'm really excited about this because I think that as we think about this, think about shifting giving, and it seems like a really big, big job, but I think that we have a really great opportunity to do so with a lot of the things that you're likely already thinking about for your fundraising plan, thinking about for your next campaign, and thinking about as you're really wondering how to really connect with those donors more specifically. And so I think the great thing is that, as Hope mentioned, people do believe in giving, they want to give, and so as fundraising really have a great opportunity to make it easier for them and make them feel more empowered, make them really get more connected to the idea that that giving has an impact and that they have the means and um, the opportunity to do even a little bit more. And I think that's the thing is about moving them down that continuum. And I think, you know, for that, we really think about the idea of donor-centric fundraising as being the mechanism for doing that, really thinking less about the, the organization's needs, thinking less about the, the fact that we need to meet our budget, you know, shortfall, or we need to meet our goal, and more about shifting that conversation to what's going on with that donor to really unlock those dollars that I think um, are being left on the table. And so um, I have a couple of, of points on each screen that we'll walk through pretty quickly, um, but if you do have additional questions, please let me know. So I think what, these are some core tenets about donor-centric fundraising that really harken back to some of the opportunities that HOPE identified. Thinking about how you tap in to the idea of that donor and their motivations for, for giving to your cause or for giving in, in, in general, thinking about how we can be much more specific and relevant to each donor or maybe rather each segment of donor. And then make sure that that experience that we take them on this journey of giving, um, that we're keeping that really consistent, that we're keeping them in that moment of giving so that at each moment, we're really allowing them to rem remember the reasons why they give and why it's so important and that really tangible impact that they have, um, in addition to making it very easy for them to do. And so Hope mentioned there is some frustrations with donors in terms of the process may seem overwhelming, the process may seem too complicated, it must, may take too long, and so I think there are some ways that we as fundraisers can take that and make it much easier for them to take action in the moment, um, and make it very simple for them to give, um, and hopefully by doing that we actually enable them to give more uh, over time. And so let me flip to the next slide here. So what I like to think about is optimizing the, don the donor's giving experience, and, and this is something that you'll hear Hope talk a lot about. When I think about the giving experience, I'm not just talking about maybe what we might typically talk about in terms of on-page optimization for, let's say, your donation page. I'm talking about that entire experience from the moment they might hear about your cause or the work that they do um, to the first communication they get, to the interaction they may have with you through social media, to the actual moment that you're asking them for the gift, 
and then what's that process um, going forward. And so I think it's good for us to think about that because I think when nonprofits nail that for each donor segment, they have much better results because that that story that they're telling um, that really stars the donor is held true throughout that entire journey. Um, and it's really um, self-reinforcing is what we see. And so the first step is really to understand who, who are your segments, what, what have some of your campaign results been so far. Think about the giving trends. We publish a lot of those statistics on our website. I believe that Global Giving has some great information as well, along with the, the Money for Good findings to see how does that line up to what your data says. And then review how each of your segments are already giving to provide a baseline. And then start to think about how you might want to shift that forward. A great way to really think about that is to do some of your own research and, and, you know, employ simple surveys, think about doing some donor focus groups to really dig in to understand how some of your key donors or some of those representative donors might fall into these segments, and then assess what that journey is for your donors right now. The second thing to think of is, okay, well then how do you shape the offer for each of those segments? And so I think that what you can do, and I know that Allison's gonna talk about this in more detail, but how do you map your supporters to the Money for Good personas to leverage what we know about them to build that donor experience for each of those segments? So how do you craft that message much more explicitly to them to answer some of those questions, to get them over some of their fear or concerns, and to really create those targeted messages? We don't wanna send the same message to all donors because that's not going to be effective to address maybe what's holding them back from giving more. And the way that one of the great tools that you can use is a great editorial or communication calendar. How often are you hitting those points for each segment? And just map that out and it'll, that will help you, it will help your staff, and it will help your message be much more consistent over time. The other thing is also to combine that offer with the relevant giving options that make it really easy for each segment. One segment might prefer to give in one way. Uh, maybe they're likely to give more through direct mail. Others might wanna give more through um, those online mechanisms. And then of course, here are just some tips about the optimize, optimization of the actual donor experience once they are really in your funnel. Think about how you're telling the story, your consistent story, your consistent design, no distractions that are going to take them maybe off message. And then make sure that that's followed up through with your stewardship plan. And then finally, of course, you want to make sure that that process itself is very easy for them to do. So how does that match the donor preferences? The clear language that you use to get them to take action, make sure that's reinforced in all of your fundraising materials. And then make sure that you have implemented those mobile-friendly options, responsive pages, ways for people to give through social, because we do know that those methods are growing and that those are likely something that individual segments of your donors are really looking for that will enable them to give more over time because it's much more easy for them to do so. Um, finally, I just want to mention in terms of this perception of how people are giving and how much they're giving, it's important for you to actually illustrate that for your donors through your appeals, through testimonials, and maybe through those phone calls if you're doing phone solicitations to let them know how others are giving and how much because we know that that kind of social proof or kind of what we call that peer pressure for good will actually motivate donors to um, actually give a little bit more and give more often. And so with that, I hope um, I, the floor is now yours again, and I will pass the control over to Allison as well. Great, thank you, all right. Well, so I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, how we, how Global Giving has tested out the Money for Good research and the segmentation tool. So we had three goals for engaging with the Money for Good research study. Um, and the first was to bolster our approach as we've been seeking to reframe giving. So we've been working on this idea of reframing giving on our own over the past few years. And the Money for Good findings were aligning with other research we're also doing from the Narrative Project and other sources. Um, and so we, re we believe that getting closer to the Money for Good study and the results could only really help us. And next, we wanted to find a better way to focus our resources on specific donor segments. So like most nonprofits, we're trying to re increase our donor retention. So getting people who give, more, give once to give more than once um, and to get repeat donations from longtime existing donors and also to build better systems for integrating new donors into our community and inspiring them to give again. 
So right now we have a pretty good understanding of our donors in terms of their demographics. We can learn that in aggregate from Google Analytics. Um, but we found it pretty compelling to have a different way to understand individual users based on their attitudes and behaviors. And that's what the study allowed us to do. We think that doing this is really going to help us increase our ability to have and maintain good relationships with these donors. And as we're hiring a content marketing manager right now, we saw uh, these results as an opportunity to, to use them as a starting point for reframing the content that we're now um, going to be focusing on creating in order to draw in new donors. And then lastly, we also wanted to help Canva test and improve the segmentation tool because we have a vested interest in helping small nonprofits um, use this type of research better. So here, here are the different steps for us testing the tool. Um, you know, because of the thoughtfulness and the care that the Canberra team put into the study, we really believed it could be a great place for us to start with our own segmentation. So uh, we decided to use the survey tool that uh, the Canberra team provided to do a survey of our own 160,000 opt-in email newsletter subscribers. So we slightly modified it to make sure that the questions made sense for our users. And we used Typeform, an online tool, to host the survey, and we sent it out to our MailChimp email. Next, we ran the 1,600 responses through Canberra's segmentation tool, um, and we were able to assign each respondent um, into a Money for Good segment. And after that, with the help of the Canberra Collective team, we did initial analysis of those respondents' donation histories, and we compared their donation histories to their survey responses. And don't worry, all of the data was anonymized. Uh, but we were looking to see if we could find giving patterns amongst patterns amongst the different segments. And right now, we're in this fourth step, which is looking to see if we can extrapolate the learnings based on those donors who responded to the survey to the rest of our donor base. So here's what we found, just um, a quick look at what we found. We found that our largest segment was the cautious drivers. And interestingly, they also tended to have the highest net promoter score, which is a measure of their satisfaction of giving through global giving. And so this group represents a lot of promise for us. They're highly engaged, satisfied givers. But we have to ask ourselves, are we doing enough to enable them to become advocates for global giving, given their good relationship with us? The next highest segment in terms of group size is content and benefactors. And it looks like they actually even contribute more in terms of dollars compared to other segments. That's what you see on the, the chart on the right. However, they happen to have lower than average satisfaction with global giving as reported through their um, NPS or net promoter score. So in some ways, they're actually our discontented benefactors. And so we have to ask how we can improve their giving experience through global giving to make them satisfied, contented benefactors through global giving. And then another finding that's really interesting if you compare these two charts is that the busy idealists on the left represent an untapped potential because there's the third largest segment, but on the right you see they give lower than average donation amounts. So we're thinking we can focus on increasing the average donation amount for this group. Next, we also found that cautious drivers, our largest group, contributes more to Africa than other donors do. So because we have projects around the world, we're able to compare donor history. Uh, we were able to see, you know, we can think about how we can retarget this group with the year-end donation asks at the end of the year um, in order to more prominently feature projects for Africa to see if we can bump up their year-end giving by offering them more targeted asks. So I'll skip over most of these points here, but you know, in general, this, this is still a work in progress for us. We're at about step three or four of a 10-step process, but our next steps are really going to be to test out some of the hypotheses based on our findings. And you know, as you dive in to think about how you could begin to test the findings, you should know that Canberra has updated the segmentation tool based on some of our feedback, and it's now available online for you for free. And in general, you know, for us, I really realized that this takes a team. There were several of us who were interested in the work, but it really takes a team to actually analyze the data and have several brains and several perspectives so that we can, um, you know, come up with some better ideas and build some strong hypotheses. 
And I also learned that it fell into the important but not urgent category for most of us. So while it was something that we were really interested in doing, it wasn't worked into our annual planning for the team when we were thinking about strategy. So it's moved slower than we thought. So that would be my advice for you is to get this, um, get thinking about this in terms of your annual planning and strategic thinking. And that's it for me. Great, Allison, thank you so much. And I know that <clears throat> Allison and I talked about kind of the, what each of our organizations have learned from this trial process. And there were, really was this important piece about um, thinking about opportunities to do trials at moments that are strategically relevant for organizations. And it um, was striking to observe how that was the case here as, as another trial. We, before we are, at, by way of wrapping, we wanted to just um, recap the, the opportunities that we suggest for driving change in individual donor behavior and then making another pitch for making sure that the, the learning effort from that work is deliberate. And so as we've talked through, we see opportunities to reframe giving for Americans to make it a more exciting, dynamic process and provide a new platform for engaging with donors. We see opportunities to target donor segments and to shape the full donor experience to meet target segment needs. And third, we see opportunities to correct donor misperceptions so that they are able to, they're aware of how they're actually giving and might seek to close the gap between how they would like to give and how they're giving today. Uh, before we open the floor for questions, I also wanted to make available to, or to provide to all of you information on the, of the report and the resources that are available to you. There is um, more information on, there is the Money for Good report, not just more information on the report, as well as the raw data for it, the segmentation toolkit, which is in the back of the report, and the segmentation, uh, the, the donor classification tool that Allison just mentioned on the Money for Good website. And you're also welcome to reach out to any one of the three of us um, after the panel, should you have direct questions you'd like to ask us, our emails are on the page. You're also welcome to request further information from the Money for Good at Canberra Collective um, email as well, although we, I field many of those, and so you're welcome to just email me directly. With that, why don't we open the floor for questions? Great. Thanks, Hope, Allison, and Karen. This has been excellent. Um, one quick question that I uh, just got. So I'm noticing that the, uh, unfortunately, the link um, on your screen right now, the Money for Good website link, um, you can't select it. So I am sending out that link in the chat box right now. So for those of you that asked how to navigate to that, the link is right there in the chat box, and that's Camber collective.com slash money for good. And that's where you can download the full report as well. Um, and then, uh, so moving into some questions, um, we also got a couple of questions about the recording and slides. Yes, uh, you will have access to the recording and slides via email within 48 hours. So um, stay tuned for that. Um, let's see, so we have a really interesting question about um, the unaware potentials um, segment that you mentioned, Hope. And, and Allison, I, I think you might actually have some great insight on this. So um, the question was, letting donors know that they aren't giving enough seems kind of tricky. Any suggestions on how to delicate, delicately handle that, um, particularly for these unaware potentials, um, with respect to, you know, letting them know that they aren't giving enough, but also letting them know what other donors are given. So Allison, do you have any insight on that? Well, that's a great question. And actually, yes, when we were doing the survey, um, we had people email us saying, I don't, you know, because one of the questions is, how do you think your, your giving compares to others? And we had people email saying, I don't think about how my giving compares to others. In fact, I don't want to compare it. That's not why or how I give. So you're right. It is a really extremely sensitive question. And actually, Karen had mentioned a couple ideas in her presentation, so I'm going to actually pass the ball to her because I would love to hear a little bit more about her suggestions about how to do that. Right. No, I think that's a good important point, Allison, and, and I laugh, I'm kind of laughing because I think there's the information about what donors say they want to hear and don't want to hear, and then what we do know from research about what they actually, what actually moves the needle. And so they may say to you, I don't want to know what other people are giving, or why does that matter to me? That's not how I make my decisions. But what we do know is that when you surface that kind of 
um, information to them, it does actually influence their decision to give and then how much they give. And there's some great um, background information in the, um, a, a great book that I love is um, Science of Giving, which has a lot of experiments in there. But I think some simple things to do, um, especially if you're doing this through um, appeals and through maybe your donation mechanism, is to say most of our donors are giving X or an average donor that's supporting this program is doing this on a regular basis. And we often do that, reference that in terms of monthly giving in a way to, to kind of set the norm, set what other people in their community are doing, set what the other people who might share that same sort of identity. If I feel like I am an alumni of a program and I know that other alumni of the program are annually giving X and I'm not giving that much, then that kind of makes me stop and think. Other ways to do that are to just show that other people are giving to you with donor scrolls, tickers, thermometers, things like that. And then, of course, through phone scripts, you can also have some great success because you'll know specifically who you're talking to and you can take a look at not only their background giving, but what other people in their cohort are giving. So those are some, some simple ideas that I think will help you overall. And then you can start to think about how you might apply that more specifically to some of the populations we talked about today. Great, great. Um, Hope, next question for you. So we have a question about the, um, the focus of the Money for Good Research with um, $300,000 and above. So we have uh, quite a few organizations noting that they, their base is significantly less. So um, is, you know, lower brackets or smaller brackets um, included in Money for Good or are there other research efforts that do? Hey, Cody, thank you. It's a great question. The, the research actually focuses on households of $80,000 $80, a year and above, and we did an oversample of households with $300,000 a year and above. So any organization that is focusing on um, raising money from individuals of household income of $80,000 a year and above should find these results relevant, and these results should be relevant to them. Excellent, excellent. Um, and so I think the next question, um, Hope, we'll start with you just sort of um, from the research perspective, but I think Karen and Allison, you guys might also have some insight. So um, for organizations that are facing this need to build connection with donors, has the research, um, Hope, has the research in, eliminated any opportunities for fundraising with organizations that must also deal with a stigma um, or uh, the stigma around their core services or maybe controversy around the work that they do. So I, I think that this, um, I think that the research speaks to that to the degree that I think donors are saying to us, we don't feel as if nonprofits are being honest enough um, with us about the challenges that they're facing, whether that's organizational challenges in terms of running their organization or challenges in terms of the populations they serve. So I'd actually ask, is there opportunity to talk with donors more, um, more substantively or more frankly about the challenges in the population and nevertheless how service to that population could be inspirational or um, absolutely the right thing to do? So I think just speaking to the, the challenges in the population directly would probably go a long way. Excellent, excellent. Karen, Allison, either of you want to chime in on that? Uh, I think that, you know, what we, what we would recommend for most organizations in that, in that situation, I think this specific example was around mental health services. Um, you know, I think it's about figuring out who, who you're communicating with and then how that particular issue relates to them and what they care about. Um, and I think that, that Hope is right. You know, you, you definitely have to be up, up front and transparent about that, but I think it's also about connecting the end result of what you do with um, you know, kind of maybe to some degree um, the, the, the personal motivations of each person, like why, how does that affect them? How does that affect their community? How are you answering the question, you know, why is this, why is this issue relevant to me and what can I, then what can I do about it as an individual? And so I think there's an incredible opportunity there, I think, to actually make a really compelling um, case for giving in that situation. Um, but you have to shift it from the, to, to think about what's in, what's in it for your donor, really. Great, great, excellent. Um, next up, Allison, we have a question that I think you will have some, some great insight on. So do you have any recommendations about to how to introduce the idea of donor segmentation to lay leaders who are not aware of the concept? So in your experience, you sort of mentioned the important but not urgent concept. So there might be a varying degree of 
both familiarity and willingness to sort of dive into donor segmentation across the organization. Do you have any recommendations on that front? Yeah, well, it's a great question. And I think those of us who are in, you know, communications or fundraising roles um, already, even if we're not thinking about uh, donor segments in particular, we're already segmenting our messaging based on medium, right? So you probably have online, um, you know, people who are on your email list, people who come to your website, people maybe on your mailing list. So you're already probably thinking about how to change your messaging, even if it's just change your call to action from click versus call um, based on medium. And so if you, you know, that is one way to sort of introduce this idea of, look, we're just right now assuming that all people who come to us through our website um, have this way, you know, very specific way of thinking about us versus people who we engage via direct mail. Um, but this is, donor segmentation is then taking that further and saying it's not just about the medium in which they engage with you, but also then the, um, you know, the types of motivations that they have. And I think actually showing this chart with the breakdown of these specific segments is a really interesting way to do it. Um, and you could even invite the leaders to take the survey themselves. Um, that's part of the tool is actually um, letting people take the survey themselves and seeing where they fall and, you know, and saying, does this resonate with you? Does this not resonate with you? Why? Where else would you see yourself here? What kind of messages do you usually engage with? So I think providing sort of like a hands-on um, experience with segmentation, um, you know, to get your your peers to start thinking about how they're different from one another might um, be an interesting way to introduce this idea of donor segments. And Karen, you've been exposed to the Money for Good results in this research for a number of years, and I'm sure I've had to speak to the segmentation and what on earth is it to other people within Network for Good. Do you have any tips on how, the, how you've kind of talked about what segmentation is and why it could be important? Yeah, I mean, I think, if, you know, especially if you're, you're trying to introduce this as a concept uh, that you want to focus on and maybe and invest a little time and, and even resources in, when, you know, I think Allison has some great opportunity there that you're likely already doing this, and so that makes it a little less scary. The other thing that you, you likely are, are already doing or could be an easy case to make is people that are on your list, segmenting the people who have given versus people who haven't, and you're going to want to speak to those people differently. And so I think that's a good place to start, um, and then once you've nailed those basics, you can start to get a little bit more sophisticated into breaking those folks down into how did we acquire them and how do we communicate them? Um, you know, what, how do we know based on our surveys or our conversations with them why they give and how do we speak more specifically to those reasons versus a different um, opportunity? Uh, and we've got some really good resources at Network for Good that will walk you through um, some basic segmentation and kind of give you a little bit of step-by-step -step of how you even just start to think about that. And then I think you can take some of those tools and, and start to make that progress with your with your board, with your leadership, with your staff, um, because I think it, it's just going to be so important. This is how you stand out as an organization. Unfortunately, not many organizations are segmenting, um, and so this is how you stand out to an individual donor. You know, it, it's a it's a different thing. They're not used to being spoken to so relevantly and specifically, and that's what makes your message. That makes, that's what gets them to even open your message in the first place. Excellent, excellent. And um, Karen, there's one question about, um, you mentioned about sort of optimizing the, the, don the donor experience. Do you have any um, best practice examples on how to make it easy to give, for example, um, for online interfaces or other processes? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think you have to think about how many messages a donor receives, how many messages are, and things are we doing each day, and it has to be very fast. And first of all, that's it. It has to take the, the least amount of time because the longer it takes, the more unlikely we are to do it. Um, and you have to keep people focused on the task at hand. There's often this urge to, we've got a donor going down the path of giving a donation. Let's try to collect as much information as possible. And I understand that desire, but it's actually the wrong thing to do because the more stuff you're asking them up front, the less likely they are to even complete that action. So it's really about the amount of information that you need to collect up front versus maybe what you can collect after. Um, I think it's making sure that you can reach those donors no matter what device they are on, no matter where they are, making sure that that, because we are seeing mobile giving growing. Um, and then I think the, the last thing is really more about maybe a philosophy, is really to think about how does that message that you're sending connect with each step of the way. So if you're sending an appeal that talks about, um, you know, 
feeding um, 10 homeless people, the, the page that you send them to needs to talk about that. The donation amounts that you offer up to them need to reflect, a, you know, a, a reasonable gift string that would match that ask. And so it's really about keeping that story consistent, keeping them in that moment of giving so they don't even have to think about it. They've already been inspired. You're giving it, uh, them an easy mechanism to do it, and they're just going to complete the process. Great, great. And um, I'm seeing that we are right at the top of the hour, so I definitely want to respect um, all of your and attendance time. Um, Hope, I just wanted to check in with you. Any last minute parting thoughts? The the only last minute thought that I would have is very much to this question of how we think about introducing the idea of segmentation to, to leadership. And I would say that the most important thing in any of the money for good results is really to understand what an, or the organization is trying to solve as a problem. So as um, with introducing donor segmentation, I'd really suggest um, sharpening the, describing how to use the segmentation as a way of solving whatever problem your business is trying to solve. And um, I think always focusing on what the leadership's kind of biggest preoccupations are in terms of fundraising is the most important piece. And as I'm sure um, Karen and Allison would also be willing to do, I'd be more than happy to communicate with any of you offline who have specific questions relevant to your organization. But again, huge thanks to all of you for joining the, the, um, this discussion. It was really valuable for each of us, and we look forward to being in contact going forward. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thanks, Hope and Allison and Karen. This has been really great. I hope all of you in attendance found this as informative as I did. Um, we covered a lot today, so as I mentioned before, you'll receive an email within 48 hours with the link to the recording of today's event to refer back to as many times as you'd like. That email will also include the slides from today's presentation as well, which were also very informative. In the meantime, if you have additional questions, um, Hope, Karen, and Allison's contact information is right there on the screen. Uh, and also, if you have any questions about GuideStar Platinum that I mentioned before, um, you can drop those in the post-event survey that will come up on your screen right as you close out today. Um, and with that, thanks again, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.